let me finish up <coughs> immigration here. It um, shouldn't take too terribly long. This this will uh, conclude the lecture videos for the first unit. Now there will be more that you need to read over. I've told you this before to prepare for the first exam, which will be next week. Uh, so the, the last chapter of the first unit is about politics and political issues in the late 19th century, and uh, people followed that intensely, kind of as a form of entertainment. So. This is not too bad. You need to read over it and be basically familiar with it. <laughs> okay. Just taking up where I left off. What was nativism? <clears throat> nativism was prejudice held by people whose uh, ancestors had immigrated earlier. Prejudice against those who had come later. Nativism. Okay. Not regarded highly. The uh, more Lucy sounding term xenophobia is something of a, of a, and a that is close to being a synonym. So we see a lot of that. There, there was even an organization set up in the late 1880s called the American Protective Association because uh, in their minds the, the idea of America or being an American being associated with uh, Protestantism and Northwest European ancestry, that to them seemed under threat. I guess in a pure sense it was, as we seem to have lived over it, but uh, the organization flourished for a while to make immigration an issue. It's not the first one of its kind. There's stuff like that going on as far back as the 1840s when the Catholics from Germany and, Ar Germany and Ireland began coming in in large numbers. Okay. <coughs> So, um, nativism, there's some, now here's where it, here's where it gets real, okay, there were some economic issues at stake, because um, the, the whole situation of low wages, in, especially for unskilled work in industry, wages being pushed down, that is routinely blamed on greedy capitalists. But there's a whole other dynamic at work there. It's an unregulated labor market. And if enough immigrants come in who are hungry and desperate and will work for starvation wages, that will have the effect of driving wages down. So from its earliest days, the American Federation of Labor uh, militated against, they, they favored limiting immigration. They didn't change that to less than 30 years ago, just to be politically correct, I suppose. And that's true. That, those, that's an economic reality that cannot be avoided. That would come into play today. Uh, immigration is kind of a hot button issue in our own time. Um, even though the United States has very generous immigration laws, I was going to put this in somewhere, so I'll put it in here. This is now, today. The United States annually admits more legal immigrants than all the other 189 countries in the world combined. And we still get reamed out for being too exclusive. So the issue is if people come in with no skills, no means of support, some of them are going to be fugitives from justice if you just throw open the doors and say you come in and commit a crime we won't prosecute you if think about naming a park after you i'm being that's over the top not too far over the top uh, then you're just going to be a magnet for fugitives from justice they're going to be human traffickers they're going to be drug smugglers those are realities you can't get around it and uh, do these people are they even even the honest ones that's most of them are they really going to add anything or are they going to put burdens they're going to put uh, burdens on us that we're scarcely um, scarcely prepared to bear so uh, and it would depress wages it has no it, it's going to make finding work much more difficult for people who are legally here and who need just any kind of job they can find it's not going to work in their favor and I think they might be figuring that out so those are the economic in, uh, issues now industrialists back in those days opposed restricting or limiting immigration. They oppose that, and that hasn't stopped. The United States Chamber of Commerce, which was for a long time a kind of conservative bastion, the United States Chamber of Commerce in our own day 
steadfastly opposes strict enforcement of our immigration laws because they want cheap labor. They don't mind illegal immigrants. They think they can dodge the legal consequences of employing them and they can hire them for less than they could for illegal Americans. Those are just hard realities. Uh, sadly, it gets distorted by politics. Okay. Now, it was in the 1880s that for the first time the United States began setting up some uh, restrictions on immigration. This is partly in response to, to a public outcry on the great increase in immigration. But um, by that time, most governments of industrialized countries were controlling immigration. And so part of it is just our getting with the program, getting, getting caught up. So Congress did enact some relatively timid immigration laws at the time. They may, can't rule this out, they may have been for the purpose of giving the public the false impression that immigration was being restricted when it really was not effectively being. So the first laws were reasonable. They attempted to, to exclude people who had communicable diseases, people who were criminals or were fugitives from justice, polygamists or people who had more than the ordinary quota of wives and husbands, that sort of thing. Those are not unreasonable. And further into the mix, there was at the time what we would call a pseudoscience or a false science, taken seriously in those days, called phrenology. I'll put the word up here, spelled with a PH. It was believed by practitioners that since everyone has bumps on their scalp, they could feel up the bumps on a person's scalp and derive from that a character profile and could determine by the pattern of the bumps on a person's scalp whether that person had a criminal personality. So when we uh, set up processing for for people getting off the boat from Europe or wherever, especially when Ellis Island started in oh, 1907 or 8, somewhere along there, uh, one of the tables you had to pass when you came in was the phrenologist and you held your breath because if that practitioner does not like the pattern of the bumps on your scalp, say, sorry, you're going back. Families were broken up over this. Will we ever get it right? Okay. So until the 1880s, all that happens, anybody can come from anywhere, all that's going to happen is they're going to write down your name, keep a record of it. And often the overworked and hurried and harried clerk sitting at the desk trying to write people's names down can't tell exactly what you said, so they write, write down what they thought they heard. And there were a lot of immigrants who thought they'd been given new names when that happened. So <laughs> here we go. All right. Um, uh, other law, I think in 1882, Congress passed a law to satisfy people on the West Coast who had to have somebody to discriminate against. They, It was called the Chinese Exclusion Act. Does that need explanation? Um, and there was a law making it illegal to import laborers already under contract. Industrialists had fast-talking, smooth-talking salesmen working, you know, Austria, Hungary, Eastern Europe, places like that, with all these glowing uh, sales pitches about how great life would be in America, and here's what you're going to get paid, and they sign up and come over here only to find they're being paid less than subsistence wages. That became illegal. As usual, we can't say it stopped. It just became illegal. Okay. So uh, uh, between then and World War I, Congress on three occasions passed laws imposing a literacy test on all legal immigrants. Three different presidents vetoed those laws on the grounds, this makes sense, that illiteracy was um, far more likely a sign of um, lack of opportunity than lack of intelligence. In 1917, President Wilson became the third president to veto such a law. Congress then overrode the veto. And to this day, the Immigration and Naturalization Service administers literacy tests. All legal immigrants age 12 and above have to show that they can read some language. It does not have to be English. 
So serious immigration restriction would come in the 1920s. That's a story for another day. Okay. Um, and as I say, I don't know the exact year, 19678, somewhere along there. Uh, a processing center was set up in New York City on Ellis Island, and it remained open for decades. And that was the funnel through which uh, immigrants entered the United States. And it's become something almost of a uh, status symbol to be able to claim uh, descent from people who came in through Ellis Island. When the volume of immigration became too great for Ellis Island to handle unassisted, they set up a secondary processing center in Galveston, Texas. But we hear much less about that one. Okay, is there anything else? Okay, as I've already alluded to earlier, I'll, I'll cap it off with this. This led gradually over a long period of time to a sort of change in what I call the national ethnic self-image. How do we see ourselves? Until well after the Civil War, a generation after the Civil War, um, white Americans had blinders on where black Americans were concerned. They just, they just didn't really factor them in. It's like they didn't count. It's not that they're just seething masses of racism and hate. It's just they don't take them seriously as Americans, or they tend not to. They got rid of slavery. What else do you want, you know? But um, the idea was that uh, to really fully be an American, you're a Protestant, you're white, you're from, your ancestors came from Northwest Europe. That's gone. There might be a few people who think that way lurking around. I'm going to go out on a limb and say they're Americans. They get to think that if they want to. If you don't like it, the best way to make it go away is to ignore it and let it die a natural death because the more you poke at it, the more it's going to poke back. That's just such a simple lesson. It seems so hard. But now, to reiterate what I said earlier, anyone can come from anywhere, and there are, there are some things here that you need to be able to do. Assume you're, you're, that your primary national identity is American, as in the United States of America. Learn the language and agree to go along with certain basic political precepts, i.e. you're not here to try to overthrow the government, but to uh, enjoy the blessings of liberty. Then uh, there we go. And again, um, we're a very generous country. Too often today, when people use the word immigration, they're referring to legal, illegal immigration. The question there is partly those people and their aspirations and such. Behind that, there's this whole other dynamic, and that is, are we or are we not going to have laws? This will do it for Unit 2. Uh, the next lectures I post, we'll have to do, this will do it for Unit 1. My goodness, I'm getting old. I, that couldn't be right. Oh, <laughs> will be, the next ones will be unit two, three chapters, one of them I'm not that fond of.